Good morning. My name is Mary Calder. I'm part of the pulpit supply team, and it's my pleasure this morning to welcome Heather Coots as our guest preacher for today. The good news is that Heather is not only here for today, she's going to be with us until probably Marlene gets back. However, However, she will not be with us the next two weeks because she is going to England. Shall I tell them why? Sure. <laughs> she is going on a dog training course in England. So we will miss her for two weeks, but she will be back. So Heather, you will be particularly interested to listen to our wonderful musical team. They are unbelievable, and Heather is a fan of music. Her also, she, as you know from our newsletter, is interested in healing care. So we look forward to her help in that area, where she will be with us and our pastoral care committee. So Heather, welcome. I always think it's like, you know when you go to a job interview and they say, well, do you have any questions? Okay, I'm going to need some time off. <laughs> God be with you. Are announcements behind us, or do people come up and make announcements? You come up? Oh, does anyone have an announcement? <laughs> okay, well, that was a lot of work. <laughs> Celebrations, birthdays. I used to love doing birthdays, wedding anniversaries, new babies. Grand, great grandbabies. Great grandbabies. Woohoo! That's good news. And concerns. Yes, yes, I was, of course, yes. I, I, I hope she's not in too much pain. I hope she's doing all right. That's a pretty hard bone to break, if I'm correct. So, yeah. So send her our thoughts and our prayers for a speedy recovery. And as we gather together, we share passing the peace, and again, from our experience, because I was in ministry during, of course, COVID, so you can just touch your heart, or you can bump elbows, or do whatever feels right for you. No. Peace of God. <laughs>
Let us gather together as we share the acknowledgement of our land. We acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the people with whom Treaty 6 was signed and the territory wherein our church resides. We acknowledge our responsibility as treaty members and we also honor the heritage and gifts of the Métis people. is the second Sunday in Lent. On Sunday morning, for a brief space of time, we leave behind the world of home and work and school. The world where we have our list of things to do, activities to participate in, tasks to complete. We come here this morning seeking something else. We come here seeking a shift from the ordinary to the sacred from doing to being. I invite you to close your eyes and let go of your list. Recall that it's the season of Lent. Remember the parable of the sower. The sower throws the seed, and where it lands determines if it will grow or not grow. Think of it this way. Think of the season of Lent as the sower, the time when seeds of faith are thrown with special intensity. As a, time when, as a time when God calls us in a low, urgent voice. Listen, Jesus is being drawn to Jerusalem, where God is calling to you. What is God calling you to do? As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of injury done to the earth and its ecosystems. <clears throat> Let us pray. Loving God, as we journey through this holy season of Lent, may we be open to your presence. Give us the strength to make the changes that are needed in our lives and the courage to take on the work of transforming the world. Amen. I invite you to our call to worship. Our Lenten journey invites us to travel paths we may not know, 
paths of both challenge and possibility, uncertainty and hope. We travel alongside generations who have gone before and now lead us with faith. Our Lenten journey calls us to feel the rich soil of new life under our feet, soil that helps us grow. We are guided by Christ, who tends to us as one who knows us so well and desires our companionship. Now, worship together. And let us pray. Come to us, holy God, as we come to you. Encircle us with your love. Bless us with your presence and surround us with your grace. Help us be open before you in all our gifts and frailties. You call to us to walk ways that seem difficult, and so our response is often half-hearted. Help our desire to walk with you, even when the road is rocky and we do not know what lies ahead. Draw us to your word and way that we may be strengthened to follow your son Jesus, whose spirit is in our midst and whose life taught us how to live in the ways of justice, righteousness, and deep faith. Amen. And we sing together and stand as we are able. Voices United 537, your work, O oh God, needs many hands. Good morning. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Open our ears and our hearts as we listen to your word for our lives. May we each hear the message we need to guide our lives on this day and the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 to 7 and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and also give you a son by her. I will bless her, 
and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Our New Testament reading comes from Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain their whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the, man, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. <laughs> with me, a scene in which the disciples are sitting together. Now it's years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, 
And this group of Jesus followers are just chatting and talking about all the string of events that changed their lives forever. One of them turns to Peter and says, So, uh, Satan, isn't that what the teacher called you? Satan, what was it like to stick that foot in your mouth yet again and give Jesus heck for talking about suffering and death? Another disciple chimes in, Yeah, how'd that work out for you? And then a third voice says, What were you thinking anyway? You've got to learn to think before you speak. And Peter grimaces, because this is not the first time that this has been brought up. And he mumbles, I just didn't want to hear about suffering and death. I didn't get what Jesus was talking about, because that was not what I signed up for. That's not who I thought the Messiah would be. I never dreamed that things would play out this way. And as the others became quiet, Peter looks them each in the eye and he says, I may have said it, but come on guys, you were all thinking it weren't you? This is not what I signed up for. This is not the way things were supposed to go. How many times have I uttered those words just like that? How many times have you? How many times have we realized that the things we say and we do in regard to others and our reactions to a situation are actually saying a lot more about us than they are about what is going on. I'm thinking Peter, who is my absolutely favorite disciple because he's just so human, I think that he realized all that time later that his rebuke of Jesus was about him, not Jesus. Let's think about it. Peter, like all the disciples, are really never sure exactly what Jesus' ministry is all about. We can figure that out by reading either Matthew or Mark or Luke, and a little less so by John. We can figure out that these loyal, if kind of befuddled fellows, are pinning their hopes on a big, a mega comeuppance. It was going to happen any day, and it would throw out that oppressive Roman government, throw it out on its ear. I can just imagine Peter thinking as Jesus spoke, wait, what? I was invited to fish for women and men but not this way. There wasn't supposed to be suffering involved. My life as a fisher was pretty boring and predictable. Yeah, it was, but at least it was predictable. Toss nets, catch fish. Repair nets, repeat. Not too many moments of wondering, maybe more than how many fish I'm going to catch on any given day. Now, we don't really have any way of knowing but I'm imagining Peter probably assumed before Jesus came that that's all that his life would be. He would live poor, probably die young. Oh, Peter. Oh, you and me. Rarely does life go that way. Life takes us places that we never expected or wanted to go. Peter must have questioned, now what do I truly believe? He must have questioned whether he could actually meet these new demands of faith. Did he have what it took? And we all know that there are times when life sets those very same questions before us. 
No, I don't want to go down that road. I'm unprepared. I'm frightened. I'm anxious. I'm mad at everyone and everything, including God. My faith teaches me to forgive. Well, that is not going to happen anytime soon. Turn the other cheek. Are you kidding? The first one's still red and stinging. Believe God is surrounding me with love and cares what happens to me? Well, God has a very funny way of showing me that when I receive a terrible diagnosis or someone I love does. So now imagine if we were to take a snapshot or a video, a picture on our phones nowadays of ourselves in that very moment. What would it show? Would I like what I see? I don't really have a, I'm not a really big fan of photos of myself even when I'm feeling happy. So can you bet a photo of that horrible, scary, confusing, angry, painful moment? Delete, delete. <laughs> no one is going to see this. No one is going to see me this way. Because what will they see in me? Maybe they'll believe that this is all of me, that this is how I truly am. I think if Peter could have, he might have asked for a retake. He might want to take back those words that he spoke to Jesus. Well, I'm willing to believe, even though I don't know many of you, that we all have those kinds of photos in our lives. We all have those kinds of photos. But there is so much more to Peter and to us than what one photo can show. So then why is this the snapshot that we keep going back to over and over again? As if that is all that describes us. Oh, I guess this is who I am. This is my life. We cling to that picture as we do what we humans are really, really good at doing, and that is judging ourselves and failing miserably. Even worse, perhaps, is that if we take a snapshot of another and hold it up to them and say, see, this is who you are. This is how I see you. But how can a single snapshot really tell a whole story? Answer, it cannot. It cannot tell our whole story and it cannot tell Peter's story. And for me, this is a really important lesson in this reading from Mark. This gospel story is one snapshot of Peter. He rebukes Jesus, then Jesus rebukes him. Is that it? End of story? No, of course not. Because just a few verses earlier, Peter proclaims Jesus as the Messiah. Two different pictures of the same man. This is much more a story about Peter and our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with our faith. Remember the day Peter stepped out of the boat full of faith and walked on water? That's the same Peter who also cowered in a boat, accusing Jesus of wanting him to drown. Remember when Jesus tells Peter that the future of everything he has taught lies with him to carry on because he trusts him that much? That's the same Peter who denied knowing Jesus and heard the cock crow and began to weep. Really? The same Peter? Yes, really. Peter would probably ask us to delete the photo of him sleeping in the garden when the one he's supposed to love needs companionship before his ordeal begins. But he might 
want to keep the one described in John in which Jesus is asking him to tend his sheep and feed his flock. Even Jesus himself has conflicting snapshots of himself. One where we will hear soon when he asks God to take this cup away from me, find another way. Or when he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then says, so may it be, into my hands I commend my spirit. So I wonder, why do we so often believe that our lives can be captured in one snapshot? That the day life dumps on me and I get angry at God means that I guess I just don't have any faith anymore. Is that really what's going on? Or, this one snapshot is not a final judgment, but it's information about what is happening in that moment in time. It is information about our fear, our wounds, our hopes, our needs, our struggles. What if we could take those unflattering photos and neither delete them nor condemn ourselves to believing that this is all that we are? Jesus told his disciples that following him would not be easy. He tried to help them understand that discipleship, because it was life itself, would test them to the limit. And Jesus tells us that well, as well. And Peter is us. When he blows it and he isn't the perfect disciple, he is us, me and you. And Peter is also us when Jesus understands his fear and his denial. And by responding to him, he is saying something more along the lines of Peter, this is not all of who you are. This is not who you are because I know you and I know you well. Every photo has more than one interpretation and no one photo captures all of us. We may look at a photo of ourselves figuratively now and feel shame or anger or any other of the thousand emotions that we human beings feel. We may wish we could delete it forever. Or we can look at that photo and see what our God sees. That we all have dark places within us and we all have beautiful places within us and we all have brave places within us and we all have compassionate places within us. And now is our time to call us back to all of those parts of ourselves. A bad snapshot can be a call to new life, a new way of being. Until the next time, but that is what life is. And Lent, I think among many other things, Lent is an invitation. It's an opportunity to look carefully at the photos of our lives, the metaphorical photos, this season of Lent calls us to kind of sort through them, but to keep all of them because they are what makes us who we are in all of ourselves. And calls us to believe that God sees so much more in all of us than we may see in ourselves. Look at them through Jesus' eyes. Jesus, who chose to walk with imperfect, mixed up, often confused people, and saw them as beautiful. Jesus, who trusted them to carry on when he was gone, and who now trusts us to carry on. Well, if we can do that, then I believe we can live a holy Lent. We can understand that in these Lenten days, if we choose to believe, we can see that it is not the snapshots of our lives that define us, it is Christ. It is Christ's love that sees in us more than we could ever see in ourselves. 
or in one another. And then when Easter morning arrives, we will feel free to take one more snapshot filled with joy and laughter and promise and new hope. And that is a snapshot that is well worth keeping. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us come before God with our prayers. The times of silence are there for each one of us to pray things that are deep in our hearts. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, if we have not taken time out of our days to stop, to consider, and to know that our days are given gifts. Every day we are given gifts. If we have not expressed words of gratitude for gifts that are so tiny we might even take them for granted, then help us, O oh God, give thanks now. Gracious God, you remind us that we are so much more than one snapshot. And so are the people who in our lives. And so this day we give thanks for those people. People who know us, who understand us, who accept us as we are. The people with whom we can truly be ourselves and not feel we must put on a brave or happy face. For all of those people, O oh God, we give thanks. Loving God, we know too that although we are grateful, there are things that weigh heavily upon us. And so we pray. We pray for those who this day feel no hope, 
No promise. We pray for those who see the day stretching out before them without meaning or purpose. We pray, O oh God, for all of those who this day are finding that they cannot forgive, they cannot forget, that their anger has swallowed them whole. Help us, O oh God, to give them time, to give them understanding, and surround them with your grace. We pray for all who are ill this day. Especially we pray for Marlene as she becomes, hopefully, healing, and she becomes well again. We pray for all those who are ill, and we pray for those who this day are grieving. Grieving relationships. Grieving end of life. Grieving a change in life that is uncertain. And finally, O oh God, we pray for ourselves, not out of selfishness, but out of a willingness, a need, to see what it is we can do in this, our world. And so we ask that you give us strength, you give us courage, you give us hope and promise. And we ask these gifts knowing that as you give them to us, we might hold on to them tightly and then let them go. All of these prayers we bring to you, O oh God, knowing that you will send them right back to our hands, to our feet, and to our hearts. And we pray this day in the words that our Savior taught us to say, Our Father, who well art in heaven, bend in thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us trespasses, as we forgive those who are trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is your kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God, now show us the way forward. 
and help us look beyond what is right in front of us. May God's promise to walk beside us fill us with the strength to journey further into this Lenten season. God's grace go with us. Thank you.